Hi. These are unprecedented times. I would be saying that independent of pandemics and protests and international unrest and catastrophic climate change. But speaking both globally and locally about our industry, these are unprecedented times because geospatial is also changing. It's also complex. Technology is advancing at an incredible rate, which is lucky because it seems that the problems we are being asked to solve are also becoming exponentially more complex. Indeed, each of the global complexities outlined above is being monitored by tools which are geographic because global problems are intrinsically geographic and we must be up to the task. Hi, I'm Will Caddle. I run a company called Spark Geo where we provide geospatial advice to technology companies, governments, and nonprofits. I wanna to talk to you today about strategic thinking and why it should be applied to the geospatial community of practice. We need to think strategically because the problems we face are too complex to address without a clear approach. Having a strategy does not remove the complexity of our terrain, but being strategic allows us to use a framework to travel through that more complex terrain. At Spark Geo, this is how we think about Spark, uh, about geospatial. Where humans move and landscapes change, there is value. And that is geospatial. That's how we think about opportunity. That's how we think about the market we operate in. This is the essence of what I think some people miss in our community. It's quite simple, really. Our planet is dynamic and understanding and measuring that dynamism at various different scales and dimensions is what our community really does. So if we extrapolate out algorithms at one scale or in one market, we can likely use them at a different scale in a different market. Being strategic is about being able to think of those various different scales at the same time. It's about being able to hold opposing ideas in your mind at the same time for evaluation. And it's about being able to see an objective, understanding your available tools and resources, and then pragmatically committing to a particular approach. Firstly, three thoughts and strategy and strategic thinking. I am always deeply envious of people who seem to always know what they're doing and which way they're pointing. So you might already have a strategy. You might always build geospatial software using Python. You might only ever do cartography about ski resorts because that's all you ever want to do and you don't want to touch anything else and that's what you know. Strategy is like doing something with purpose. It's knowing why. I sometimes think about it like a North Star because it's kind of a navigational aid. You don't necessarily need to be going north, but once you know where north is, the rest of the cardinal points fall into place. That doesn't mean you're not going to move around features as you move towards your north star. You've got to navigate around lakes or swamps or in the business world. You've got to figure out cash flow and you've got to figure out people and business. So all that kind of stuff's got to be taken care of, but you have an idea of where you're pointing. So you can make a short-term deviation for a long-term um, target. Strategy is useful in day-to-day -day life. It's a good toolkit for decision-making. It's a framework. Gives you an intrinsic approach and kind of this idea of a common understanding if there's more than one of you working on a particular thing. You have this common understanding around how you're going to do something. So consider the difference between a strategy and a tactic. Often people get these things mixed up. Strategy can also have scale through an organization. So what might be, um, what might be a tactic at a, at a top level might end up being a strategy at, uh, to, to, at a lower level in an organization. And let's, let's think about how organizations can be strategic and can be tactical. If you have organization A, they are a cloud company. An organization B just uses the cloud for occasional things. Cloud, comp cloud company, organization A, there's no servers, 
They have deep cloud expertise throughout the organization. They have no need for discussion on deployment methods because they already know how they're going to do it. And they have deep comfort in that approach. Organization B has a mixed storage and application environments because they're just using the cloud this one time. And they have a need for discussion on deployment because they don't really know what they're doing. And they have a need to explain themselves to their executive. They need to justify the decision that they're making. In fact, if they don't have a strategy for deployment, they'll need to justify every single decision that they're making. Or there'll be an advocation of responsibility by the executive for the deployment. And that could be even more dangerous. And this is feeling of experimentation. In organization A, the outcomes are a deep knowledge of the cloud and an ability to accelerate through a whole bunch of the execution simply because you know what you're doing from the beginning. There's no questions, no decision making. And it's easy to say no to alternative technologies or alternative methods because that's just not the way you do it. If you're in organization B, projects are slowed by decision making. You've got to make the same decisions in every single project. Um, there's a need for executive review. There's a need for retrospective evaluation. So you can see that organization A, when faced with a particular project, is going to move a lot faster than organization B, simply because they have a strategy for how they do things. They just don't have to discuss a lot of it. So what does strategic thinking look like? It's being able to think at various different scales simultaneously. So you need to be able to think uh, what the cloud would look like at a, at a corporate level, the top down. What does it mean? What is our total cost of ownership associated with the cloud? But at the bottom, how many DevOps staff do we need? And do we have the ability for them to actually do real things on the cloud? Do we have a nice big fat pipe? Do we have connections? Do we have that stuff? Do we have to move a lot of data somewhere? Are there problems? So being able to think on a, on a very strategic um, level and then being able to think how that strategy is going to be applied, that is critical for a strategic organization. And then holding opposing ideas simultaneously. So we have this strategy, but you need to be testing that strategy. You need to ensure that, that strategy is pointing in the right direction. So therefore, you need to hold opposing strategies where you need to pull the whole opposing ideas in your mind as well to constantly investigate whether what you're doing is an appropriate thing to be doing. And you're also constantly identifying and understanding resources that are available to you. It is a strategic advantage to have a good understanding of the resources which are available to you, i.e. the cloud is constantly evolving. Technology in general is constantly evolving. Our understanding and our ability to index imagery is constantly evolving. There are bazillions of sensors in the sky. There are bazillions of sensors in everyone's pockets. There's a whole bunch of data out there. Understanding that data and understanding how that data joins together is a strategic advantage. So what's this? This is a strategic spin cycle is what I call it. Um, in essence, Developing a strategy is reflective and it should be iterative. It's going to change over time. You need to navigate around those features. You need to learn how to execute. This is a rather obvious feedback diagram. What do we need to do? Why are we doing that? Is that the best way to do it? Did it work? And we just go round and round and round. If, you're, if you continually do that, then you can continually refine your strategy. It's a series of experiments in navigation and reflections. You can make mistakes and you can correct your direction if you reflect on what you're doing. You should never really reach your North Star. I can't reach my North Star. I ain't got a rocket. And no one on this planet's got a rocket big enough to get to the North Star. However, it doesn't mean the North Star is not a useful thing. If you manage to um, actually reach your strategy, then you've probably set a goal not a strategy. You execute a strategy to achieve a goal. These are two different things. Um, reflection allows us to consider this idea, critical idea of velocity instead of speed. Speed in business is a useless metric. So next time someone says, yeah, my company goes really fast, you could think to yourself, 
that's cool. You can go fast, but what direction are you going in? Is it the right direction? Is it the direction you want to go in? Do you know what direction you're going in? And, and if everyone says, yeah, I'm moving forward, my first question to ask them is, that's great, but which way is forward? So velocity is powerful if you know where you want to go. So let's think about that a little bit more. This is my velocity speed diagram. If you notice, the blue line is the line that most people take. Uh, velocity is where we are moving towards our North Star. But if you notice that so that blue line, very rarely is it actually going the same direction as the, the velocity line towards the North Star. And we would expect that our biggest fluctuations in that speed or in, that, in the distance that the speed line is from the velocity line will be when you start to first develop your strategy. You'll, you'll, you'll get it wrong and then you'll, you'll get it right and they'll be a bit wrong, they'll get a bit righter and a bit righter and a bit righter until ideally you're pretty close to the line of velocity and you kind of know how to execute on your strategy. Okay, what is modern geospatial? Let's avoid religious debates uh, and consider activities and how they're related. What is it that you do? What do others do and why? Do, uh, do open and proprietary philosophies preclude each other? Can you have open source technology and proprietary technology in the same solution? Uh, do they preclude each other? No, they do not. Uh, does the end user actually care about our software philosophy? Again, no. They uh, want a service and they're typically willing to pay for that service. So let's make that service happen. More than anything though, we should be thinking deeply about our customers and about what they actually need and whether that they need uh, the thing that we think that they need or indeed whether they need the thing that we would like them to need. Um, only after we consider a problem, the actual customer problem, should we consider technology. Ideas must be more powerful than software. They always win. The power of open source is community and in its accounting. Every line of proprietary code is maintained by its creator. And that's, that's a liability, overtly a liability. Uh, every line of open source code is maintained by a community. Therefore, it's an investment. It sits on the other side of a balance book. Strategically, there's a balance between open and proprietary technology, and that balance is a powerful brew. If you have community for support for infrastructural technology and then intellectual property protection for domain-specific expertise, you're able to stand on the shoulders of giants much more effectively. Open geospatial technology is foundational, it's infrastructural technologies like GDAL. We all stand on the shoulders of GDAL and PROJ, the EPSG codes. Broad funding for those things is necessary, but none of that precludes the fact that you can sell something proprietary on top of it. Um, so, uh, and, and that model allows smaller organizations to operate in a very meaningful way. That is powerful. Okay. Uh, with apologies to, to Mr. Magritte, uh, this is not a geospatial cloud. So I make the argument that there is no real geospatial cloud. What makes a cloud product? Well, in my mind, it's scale. Um, On-demand pricing enables scale. If pricing is wrong, then the product might be on the cloud, but it's not a cloud product unless you can genuinely access it in an on-demand manner. If you can genuinely achieve some level of infinite scale. Obviously, we don't really think about infinite computer or infinite scale, but we do not want to be confined. There are numerous tuned clouds. There's financial clouds, there's health clouds, there's IoT clouds, there's all sorts of clouds. But there is no geospatial cloud. Um, whether it's a pricing barrier or whether it's a functionality barrier, it's just not there. Technologies, companies, often use open source code, often to retain IP. Here's a good story. 
Sportio, we spend a lot of time working with the tech sector. I would go down to San Francisco, I walk into an office, and, and we have a chat about geospatial, about how it can lever how it can be leveraged inside a particular business, how, how it can be leveraged inside a particular environment. And I say, you know what? There are proprietary solutions to this. We can think about implementing uh, software architecture and enterprise software architecture. We can do all this stuff. And they say, no, 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 well, hold on. We don't want to buy software. We, uh, we want to own all the IP. That's, that's the nature. We want to own the IP so we can subsequently sell the company and build value off that. That's, that's their value proposition. They've got a bunch of venture funding to allow them to grow an organization. However, so, so we, we, we rush off and we, we, we build the thing, we stick it on uh, the open stack, and we take that, that, that open code with the proprietary IP on top and we throw it onto uh, a proprietary cloud. And, you and, and so think about that. Think about that model. The proprietary cloud is, um, uh, you know, it, it's this rabbit hole of increasing functionality, the, the, the separation between development and, um, and infrastructure is getting fuzzier and fuzzier. Uh, there are more and more spatial options in cloud environments. There's more and more proprietary cloud technology creeping up the value chain of that startup's IP, if you like. So if there was a scalable on-demand cloud with data storage and mapping and all those nice pieces just built in, it wouldn't take much of a stretch to be the choice of the tech sector. However, it's also not much of a stretch for one of the massive cloud providers just to slide in there and be that option. That's a powerful brew. That's an interesting place to be doing business because those projects are enormous. Here's an interesting story. How many people are geospatial people? And how many people are not geospatial people? Think of this in terms of a Venn diagram. I think my scale is well off here. I think the red dot should be smaller and I think the blue dot should be bigger. I think, I think there's way more people than there are geospatial people. That's not a hard thing for us to be thinking about. So when I say, that geospatial people excel at building geospatial things for other geospatial people, it means that we have two different oceans that, are, that we're operating in. Because perspective matters. We get to choose the ocean in which we want to journey. We can choose the red ocean where there is copious competition, and well understood business models, but hard to attack markets. Yeah, that's that little geospatial people ocean that we all understand because we live it. But then there's the blue ocean here. The blue ocean is the one that's almost empty of competition. Additionally, in our case, the blue ocean is potentially much larger. I wouldn't say potentially anymore. I am utterly convinced that the blue ocean is enormous. There are many more non-geospatial people than there are geospatial people. Thus, there must be more opportunity. However, potentially those geospatial solutions that we create for those normal people might not have a map. They might be a chart. They might be a graph. They might be a report. They might have an intrinsically geospatial element, but that geospatial element might not be intrinsically presented as a map. And that, to a lot of people in our immediate community, is troubling and scary, but we should embrace it because the, that doesn't mean there isn't a need for GIS people or geospatial people or people who understand geography. It just means we need to think about user interface. We need to think about putting the same thing in a different pizza box. That's not a big problem for us to solve. Let's think about two things. 
Let's think about upstream geospatial. Let's think about downstream geospatial. What on earth do I mean by that? I was on a, lucky enough to go on a trade mission to uh, the UK immediately before coronavirus. And they have this fascinating nomenclature around uh, the use of geospatial technology. Upstream guys, they create and distribute data. Might be a satellite, might be an airplane, might be drone, cell phone, GPS, who knows. It's a way of accruing or uh, building a data set that says a thing. Um, imagery, measurement, location, who knows? Signal reception, RF, who knows? And then downstream, geospatial, talk to clients. They talk to customers. They build things which are consumed. And I, I think this nomenclature is really interesting. It's like overtly oil and gassy, but it's a really interesting way of thinking about our markets and one that's it's worthwhile us pursuing. So if we dig into this a little bit, we can end up with um, some interesting assessments. Okay, so we have this um, data creation company and they are surrounded by different customers asking them about different things. Here's the thing about geo, nothing is straightforward. Um, if you are an imagery company and you create an image of a place every single day, Planet famously has been doing this, but other organizations are attempting to do the same thing. It is a fascinating value prop. It's super hard to consume. I've lived the GIS dream. I know that if someone sends me an image of a particular place every single day, what I'm actually receiving is a problem to solve every single day. Um, so I'm gonna push back and you say, I actually kinda wanna know this thing in particular about my problem set. I wanna know uh, how many trees there are in this picture. I wanna know, um, I want to know how big the, the, the fire burn is in this picture. I actually don't necessarily want to know something about this every day. I just want to know when something has changed. Has it changed? Can you tell me it's changed? But every single customer and every single vertical, think about verticals here in terms of colors. Some of them are similar to each other. Some of them are different. Um, every single customer, every single vertical is asking for something slightly different. They're almost always asking for some kind of derivative product. So often we have the data creator who are creating excellent, useful data products, but the actual customers don't want the image or they don't want that particular product. They want a derivative, which is directly relevant to their particular business. That's quite confusing. Let's think about that a little bit more deeply. What happens if instead of selling to a series of customers and trying to understand every single market, what happens if that upstream company started thinking more deeply about engaging with particular partners and letting those partners deeply understand their own markets? So those partners can enrich data or those partners can, um, build those vertically specific derivative data products. That becomes a very powerful model. It becomes very compelling. And it also means that the upstream data company only has to engage with a handful of partners. They can, if they want to, think about it like a venture portfolio. They could have a couple of partners who are in the same uh, market vertical, and they could, you know, they could encourage some level of competition, or they could commit um, sector exclusivity to particular partners for a cost. So there's lots of value in this model. There's also a great deal of trust in this model. So that's the real reason that this hasn't necessarily been adopted in, in as holistic a manner as it could have been, because we have to think deeply about trust. And trust is not a straightforward thing necessarily to engender. Once you built it, this is an incredibly powerful model and one that allows the upstream data creation company to deeply focus on what they're good at, 
which is creating high quality data products and then allows the downstream partners to dial in on exactly what their individual market vertical needs. So you could have the oil and gas partner, you could have the defense partner, you could have the big ag partner, you could have all these different partners, um, but you let them deal with the variability in, in their markets and you as the upstream portfolio data creation company get to differentiate yourself across various different markets but only with a handful of partners to manage and not having to deal with the use case associated with every single customer within a wide variety of markets. But the interesting thing about downstream geospatial is this idea of activities. We do the same algorithmic activities over and over again. This is what we learned in Spark Geo. It's, it's absolutely fascinating because we used to do, or personally, I used to do a ton of stuff in forestry. I did, uh, back in the day, I did government science, I did municipal stuff back in Scotland, then I went to, came over here to Canada, and I, did, I spent five years in the forestry sector doing a whole bunch of analysis. Lots of point and polygon analysis, trees uh, in polygons, drawing polygons around blocks of trees, that kind of stuff. And then finding out uh, different attributes of those trees and resource analysis stuff and all the rest of it. And then we thought, hey, we should put maps on the internet. Wouldn't that be a good idea? So we put maps on the internet and in doing so, realized that we're using exactly the same algorithms there that we were using in the, um, in the forest sector. So this is really interesting. So if you think about you, you as a downstream geospatial company, you have this point and polygon, point and polygon, you're doing the same algorithmic thing all over, all, you know, over and over and over again, same algorithmic thing. Um, however, every single market, every single customer here is asking for a different thing. So they call it something different. And that's a really useful thing for us to be thinking about. So they might be calling it forest resource analysis. Someone else might call it retail location analysis. Someone else might call it threat capability modeling. Someone else might call it precision, big agricultural analysis. It's still the same algorithm because geospatial is a deeply horizontal activity. If we organize those markets, we can see that the same activity is being undertaken in each of these different markets, but being delivered in a different way. All we're doing is changing the pizza box. Spark Geo, we used to do, or I used in the forest sector, used to do GIS, sort of hand bombing stuff, GUIs, a little bit of automation work, various different geospatial operations on a one-off process, on a one-off basis for various different clients all we do now in Spark Geo is wrap that stuff up into um, repeatable software products. So it's the same algorithm. It's just being taken out of the GIS and being put into a blob of software and put into a highly repeatable piece of Python or a highly repeatable piece of JavaScript. Same thing. It's still geospatial. Geospatial is an intrinsically horizontal activity. So if you are looking around for new and interesting markets, it's definitely worth thinking about the activities that we do and the activities that other people do. I don't consider geospatial to be an industry in the same way that I don't really consider relational databases to be an industry because it's a very horizontal activity. I do consider GIS to be an industry, but I consider geospatial to be a community of practice. So the same member of that community of practice might be writing a piece of code in Python and sticking it in some kind of cloud-based pipeline to be run over and over and over again for every single 
uh, every single device that plugs into a particular service. But that thing could also be done equally as well in a piece of desktop GIS. And that is interesting and is definitely worth thinking about when we ex explore our, as I've called it, an embarrassment of verticals. And it's an embarrassment of wealth because we can really apply our expertise to almost any industry. We've just got to decide how we want to apply that expertise. And we've got to decide if our expertise is, um, is packaged in the most appropriate way. So I really like this idea of, of building an appropriate delivery mechanism, thinking about the pizza box for what it is that you're good at, because that pizza box is really, is really the, the specific piece of market verticality that will separate you from somebody else. Building a better pizza box might not be a better pizza. It could be exactly the same pizza. It's a point in polygon analysis. It's a very simple piece of ge geographic um, uh, algorithm. But presenting that in the most efficient manner and getting it to someone while it's still hot, getting it to someone so it's not destroyed, getting it to someone so it's not wet, getting it to someone um, so it's the highest quality product is enormously valuable. And that's, that's a piece of the market that's often forgotten about. And if you're looking for new markets, that's a piece of the puzzle that you really should be deeply considerate of. Well, that's all from me. I hope you find this discussion about geospatial strategic thinking useful. If you'd like to think more about this, you can find us um, at spartgeo.com. At this address, spartgeo.com slash resources, you'll find a PDF document with some further writings. We also write on, on, on Forbes. And I frequently tweet. So you can find me at geo underscore will on the Twitter sphere. Uh, I'd love to hear more about this. If you got any questions, I think we're about to do a question and answer session. I might be wearing a different hat.